Hello, Eric. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm happy. I'm happy to see you, Bob. I always enjoy these talks we have. I enjoy them too. Let me let me tell us uh, tell them who you are and who I am. I'm Robert Wright, publisher of the Non-Zero Newsletter. This is the Non-Zero Podcast. You are Eric Alterman, uh, among other things, author of a book. But also, before we get to that, uh, you are what a you're some kind of distinguished professor at Brooklyn College. That is my title. Yes, distinguished professor. Of English, actually, although your graduate work was mainly in things, uh, what? I have, a, I have a PhD in history, U.S. history. I'm a, I'm a professor of English because for a bureaucratic reason, I was originally hired as a pr distinguished, quote unquote, professor of journalism, mm. which was in the English department. And then there was a split. The journalism department left the English department, uh, the journalism program left the English department, and I stay in English because I enjoy it more. Okay. I like, I like teaching it. Okay, I teach uh, literature and film, which uh, is a lot of fun. If I were in Brooklyn, which I once was, I'd take your course. Now, you are uh, also a contributing writer at The Nation and at The American Prospect. Uh, and at The Prospect, you've got a column called Altercation, I believe. Play right. on your um, name. Kind of a play on your name. Yeah, well, I... I at the beginning of the blog era, I had one of the very first blogs. In fact, I think it was, I think I hold the distinction of being the first person asked by a mainstream media organization to start a blog. I wasn't the first person to start a blog, obviously. Mickey Kaus and Andy Sullivan, Andrew Sullivan, uh, Josh Marshall preceded me. And then they, and then they were picked up by organizations. Whereas MSNBC said to me, we want you to start a blog for MSNBC. So that was called altercation. And that was a long time ago. Uh, and then uh, for 25 years, I was the nation's media columnist. And then they decided that 25 years was enough of that. And I really loved doing that blog back at MSNBC. It moved to, to Media Matters for a little while and to the nation for a little while. But I haven't done it in a long time. And I'm, and I'm really enjoying doing it at the American Prospect. Well, that is so it's sent out as a newsletter. It's sent out as a newsletter every Friday. People can get it for free if they sign up, but I I treat it like a blog, and it, it goes up on the website every Friday morning. And yet, you've still found time to write a very big book, which we're going to talk about. We Are Not One, A History of America's Fight Over Israel. Now, this will be out by the time our conversation is posted, but right now we're still a week away from publication date. So this is a chance for you to practice your talking points, Eric, and that's, <laughs> in fact, that's the main you're, purpose. You're the big time. This is the big time for me. No, oh, this is this is as good as it's going to get. Well, best of luck. Yeah. For then. Um, the uh, so so. What is this book about? Tell us what this book is about. Give us your elevator pitch, and I will yeah. read it. Thank you. Um, here's the thing. Uh, the the book's title carries a lot of weight. Uh, the we are not one. I was going to say, who is this we you speak of? First of all, yeah. but I don't want to interrupt. <laughs> Do your elevator pitch. Uh, we are not one. It, the thing is, is that Israel has occupied this very odd place in the American political imagination, and especially the American Jewish imagination. And the United States has, by and large, with very few exceptions, supported everything the Israeli government has ever wanted to do, as if Israel were the United States. Uh, uh, half of over half of the UN vetoes that America has undertaken in the UN, that's a competitive, uh, I suppose, have been on behalf of Israel. Um, we've never seriously attempted to, to prevent any major Israeli policy from going forth, even when we don't think that they're in our interest. The idea is that Israel, whatever Israel does, is cool with the United States. And, and that's ridiculous because Israel is this tiny, country in the Middle East, many thousands of miles away, surrounded by other Arab countries and and carrying out a military occupation. It's nothing like the United States. Similarly, we are we are one was the slogan of the Zionist movement um, before there was an Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh and, and there was a strong feeling and I, I think it's actually perfectly understandable and defensible um in the mid late 1940s that the jewish people their survival was in question the holocaust was horrific 
American Jews couldn't really do much about it, and they felt terrible, and they were thrilled to have the opportunity to support their fellow Jews in Palestine and help in the creation of this first Jewish state in 2,000 years. It was, it was thrilling and exciting, and it felt like a, a God-given miracle. And so the, the Zionist slogan of we are one made sense for a while. But in fact, being an Israeli Jew and being an American Jew are very, very different things. And the uh, what I call, actually I borrow the term from a scholar named Shell McGee, the Zionization of American Jewry, American Jewish identity, has robbed it of its own uh, substance. Um, Again, this made sense a long time ago. It even made sense when I was young that, that to be a Jew was to defend Israel and to remember the Holocaust and therefore to defend Israel. Um, but it no longer makes sense uh, because Israel is so different. Uh, it's a different experience. It has very different politics. Israel is a very right-wing country. American Jews are the most left-leaning white people there are. But it was not always uh, thus, right? It was... Uh, no, no. This is... This this, is, this is this is a long, I'm telling the story of a 125 year period. Right. And then the, and then the final meaning of it is refers just to American Jews. We are not, we, we American Jews. I wrote this book as a historian, but I sort of close it uh, with the observation that American Jews can no longer talk to each other because of the animosity over Israel. Israel has become, instead of a uniting force, a very divisive force in America. You can see the fight over APEX, the money APEX spent in, in, uh, on behalf of uh, election deniers and insurrectionists, and, and by, in order of defeating progressive candidates in the Democratic primary, many, if not most of which, were supported by a majority of Jews. So, um, so, it, so we are not one refers to American Jews. It refers to American Jews vis-a-vis -vis Israel, and it refers to the United States vis-a-vis -vis Israel. So, the idea that that it, the United States and Israel should march in lockstep, that there should be no daylight between them, that the United States should support everything Israel ever does, which it basically has, with few exceptions, is no longer tenable. So that's the story I'm telling. Okay, so uh, what would you say American Jewish identity was like before what you call its Zionization? And when was this? When, when, when does the Zionish, Zionization uh, begin? I mean, what, well, what would you say was kind of the state of, of American Jewish identity in like at the end of World War II before the establishment of Israel? Well, again, that's the period where the Zionist movement really took over American Jewry. Uh, once, once people became aware of what had happened in the Holocaust and felt helpless and wanted to do something, and the something was to support Jews in Palestine because there was nothing to be done, as they understood it. Not much, anyway, to save the Jews in Europe. But I would say um, the period to look at would be the period after the founding of the state of Israel, before the 1967 war. In that period, after Israel was founded, Americans just weren't all that interested in Israel. Um, they were more interested in, in, in issues that faced them in their lives. Uh, they, were, they were basically liberal. Or, American Jewish organizations really did two things in those days. They were social service organizations. And they were liberal organizations on behalf of social justice, as was defined at the time. They were, they were very much in favor of um, civil rights. They were very much in favor of separation of church and state. They were very much in favor of, um, of all social programs that were, were, that were possible. Um, in 1967, uh, leading up to and during the 1967 war, uh, this all changed virtually overnight and in a most profound way so that all these organizations, they ceased their work on behalf of social justice. They gave up most of their social uh, services functions, in part because the Great Society took them over and became 100% dedicated to supporting the state of Israel. Their budgets went from, Israel went from nowhere in their budget to, the, to not just the top of it, but to the vast majority of it. And, um, and the only other thing that occupied them was Holocaust education which is in part a way of defending Israel. Um, so, so this became, for many Jews, including the generation I was raised in, the sum total of what it meant to be a Jew, defend Israel, remember the Holocaust. And the substance of Judaism, Jewish culture, Jewish life, um, Jewish values, was subsumed in this. And, and again, that worked for a while. It doesn't work anymore. 
Israel is a very unattractive country from a, a liberal Jews perspective. And, uh, and the Holocaust was a very long time ago and other people have had their uh, mass murders and so forth. And it just, it just doesn't, Jews are, young Jews in particular, are leaving Judaism in droves, uh, in massive, massive numbers. And, and one of the reasons, there are more than one reason, but one of the reasons is that the, the, what's being offered to them by the Jewish institutions is this vicarious experience to which they can no longer relate. Now, when you say they're leaving Judaism, what exactly does that mean? Since uh, there are many people who call themselves Jews who don't go to synagogue. They're leaving, they're leaving organized Jewish institutions. So, so, the, the, so it was, Orthodox Jews are actually growing. They're a completely separate story. But the main uh, denominations, conservative and reform, and also Reconstructionists, which is where I, what I happen to fall into. Were you, were you raised in, in the Reconstructionist tradition? Yeah. So you, come, was you raised. Come, so you come from a lefty family? Actually, no. Uh, just weird. Uh, my parents joined it. They gave my father a deal. <laughs> <laughs> he put in sweat equity. It was a very small, small synagogue. It seemed like one. They wouldn't have been able to tell you what Reconstructionist meant, I bet. And, and when I went to Hebrew school, they didn't teach it to me. I, I learned about it in graduate school when I was getting my doctorate from a professor who taught American Jewish history named Arnold Eisen, who later became the very first head of the Jewish Theological Seminary, which is a conservative theological seminary, who was not a rabbi. Um, he was a sociologist. But anyway, um, conservative Judaism has lost a third of its members in the past 10 or 15 years. And Reform Judaism has lost about 15% of its members. And the only reason it's not a third of its members is because conservative Jews have become Reform Jews in many cases because it's a less demanding uh, mm -hmm. uh, lifestyle. Um, Reconstructionist numbers are tiny anyway, they're between one and 2%, so they don't really count. So, so, and the numbers, and they're all, the, the drop-off is all among young people. So young people are very critical of Israel, and they're very disaffected increasingly from, in, from organized Judaism. Now, there are other ways to be Jews, but it takes a lot of work. Like, I, I've become, I'm not at all religious, but I've become much more interested in, in Judaism over the past few years. That's actually what I spend most of my time reading and studying about. My next book is about Judaism also. But, um, but that's a lot of work. I spend hours. I'm a, I'm a scholar. That's how I relate to it. Most people just find it, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't get why they should do it. It's, it's, it's for, for most secular American Jews, particularly young Jews, if it's Israel, it's unattractive. If it's, it's anti-Semitism, well, they're not really threatened by it as far as I can tell. It's not real like it has been historically in those countries. There's definitely some worrisome things going on, but it's not, for most people, it's, it's not really a concern. And, uh, and, and it's, it's just a memory of, that they had of uh, seders and uh, their bat mitzvahs, maybe, or mitzvahs, with their families and their grandparents and so forth, and that, and that fades over time. And then, I mean, the other, the other if we're going to talk about Jews rather than Israel, the other obvious problem it faces is intermarriage, where over half of American Jews marry outside of Judaism, and the vast majority of them do not raise their kids Jewish. So they're, those, they're lost too. So, um, so Judaism, American Judaism, secular American Judaism, is definitely in crisis. And, and one of the things that I point to in the, in the conclusion of this book is that American Jewish institutions uh, refuse to own up to this crisis. They, they pretend that it's not there. They, they hype Israel. They hype anti-Semitism. Um, and, and it's just not convincing. Uh, at some point, and, and 1967 is the beginning of this current point, the rabbis as Jewish leaders were replaced by the mockers, the head of the APAC and the head of the Conference of American Jewish Presidents and the head of the ADL and the head of the American Jewish which, Committee. Which is anti-defamation league, ADL. Right. And and these people, um, they're 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 not they're not offering any substance. They're they're just offering a sense of solidarity and a solidarity that is Israel centric. And again, even if you think Israel is wonderful, and you like everything about it, and you think it whatever it does is correct, which some people do, it's still it's still not the experience of American Jews. It's very different. And and the Israelis themselves don't have any respect for American Jews. They think American, they think all diaspora Judaism is ridiculous. 
and that and that Jews should all just come and live in Israel and stop this nonsense of pretending to be able to be Jewish in the Christian world. And so um, the American Jewish institutions consistently side with the Israelis whenever there's a whenever there's a problem, and hence are unable to communicate with these disaffected American Jews. Um. Yeah. Now. I, I definitely I want to get back to the book and kind of tell the historical story a little bit. But first, I would say uh, what you're describing doesn't seem to have yet kind of caught up with Israel at a political level. In other words, uh, seems to me the uh, the lobbying of the groups you described, like APAC, is still reasonably effective. Uh, I mean, certainly, you know, in the Trump, God knows, in the Trump administration, Israel got what they want. But it's not like, uh, you know, I mean, embassy moved to Jerusalem um, and uh, Trump got out of the Iran deal. Uh, they they did encounter some resistance in the Obama administration uh, because, you know, in the in the form of the Iran deal, they weren't enthusiastic about that. Uh, but I guess do, do, would you say uh, the generational split? you're describing uh first of all do you agree it hasn't really caught up with israel at the political level um and if that's right is it just a matter of time uh, you know just just waiting for these younger jews to acquire actual political cloud or what well first of all you're assuming that we live in a democracy and we don't we live in a in an oligarchy that in which money is quite powerful so um, second of all, the Republican Party is 100% behind Israel. Bibi Netanyahu could be elected president, could could get the Republican nomination for president if he wanted. <laughs> um, and and uh, and about a quarter of Jews are Republicans and strongly supported Trump. Um, the most and many and, and many of the wealthiest Jews in America supported Trump. Now, Maggie Haberman reports that. Um, Sheldon Adelson promised Donald Trump a contribution of $20 million if he would move the uh, embassy to Jerusalem. And he said, okay. And when they did move the embassy to Jerusalem, the speakers were evangelical Christians, who, by the way, had made some enormously uh, anti-Semitic comments. And, you know, that was fine. Um, so, uh, you mean you mean it was fine with Trump? Or it was fine with Adelson so long as they delivered the embassy. It was fine with everyone. You know, nobody, mm -hmm. nobody cared. Um, so the base of uh, Israel's base, and, and by the way, Israel's leaders say, American Jews are a pain in the ass. We can't worry about them, and we don't have to, because we have the Christians and we have the Republicans. So, um, so the power of money and the, the intensity of the Republican base uh, of their Christian Zionist base, um, and the fact that about half of American Jews, about half, we don't really know, um, support APAC's position, means that, politically speaking, they hold almost all the cards. So even though J Street, which is came up, uh, came to being uh, in time for the Obama administration, and supported the Obama administration against Israel's position on their the ironic women. They uh, they represent American Jews slightly better than APEC, I would say, on most of the issues. But they're not nearly as powerful because they're not nearly as institutionally powerful and they don't raise nearly as much money. So uh, so whenever there was a, a race where APEC and uh, the Democratic primary, where APEC and J Street were pitted against one another, APEC had an enormous financial advantage mm -hmm. and, and won most of them. Not all of them, but they won most of them. Um, and it was weird. It was a weird thing. I don't know if, if people followed it outside the Jewish community, but when APAC would intervene in these races, and in some Democratic primaries, they put in six or eight million dollars into the primary, but never mentioned Israel. They just wanted to defeat people who they thought might be critical of Israel or who might ally with people who are critical of Israel, meaning the squad. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and when the head of APAC, whose name is Howard Kaur, was asked, is there anything uh, a politician could do who supported Israel that would lead you to not support him? He said, I can't think of it. Like he said, give me some time. I'll, I'll see if I can figure it out. So APAC ended up supporting 109 Republican insurrectionists. And they went 
from race to race in Democratic primaries, um, defeating progressive candidates or help trying to defeat progressive candidates and, and mostly succeeding without ever mentioning Israel. So mm. there's no question that Israel has become allied with the with the conservative side of um, American politics. Israel is the only country, only putatively democratic country in the world where Trump is more popular than either Obama or Biden. And of course, it's the very opposite among American Jews. So that's one example of the of the the rift I'm talking about when I call the book We Are Not One. Yeah. Of course, you know, it's it's not unusual for a single issue lobby to focus on that to the exclusion of everything else. For example, the NRA would say, yeah, it's all about guns. I don't care what they say about Social Security. On the other hand, as you as you know, in the book, at one point, Jewish identity was very much associated with a pretty specific set of values. And in any event, with a set of values, right, with a, it was it was it was thought of as liberal. It was it was thought of as liberal in its leaning. Um, and part of your point is that APAC is abandoning any any interest at all in preserving any particular aspect of Jewish identity other than uh, support for Israel. Yes, without admitting, and I think the I think the uh, analogy with the NRA is quite a good one. Um, I think that support for Israel, I mean, guns, 90, 80 to ninety percent of Americans support much stronger gun control legislation than we have, and it doesn't happen because of the power of the NRA, and this speaks to the weakness of our democracy. And Israel is more popular than guns are, so it's not as extreme a position, but. Uh, even though Americans, I mean, Republicans are supportive of Israel, period. Democrats are evenly divided. Half Democrats support Israel, half Democrats say they now support the Palestinians. Among young Democrats, support is higher for the Palestinians than for the Israelis. And that's a brand new situation. But how that will manifest itself in our politics, well, it's going to take a very long time. And I, I, I'm not exactly sure how it'll happen. I mean, I was I gave it this talk in Tel Aviv a few months ago in May, in May. And and some guys and 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 I and I said what I've just some of what I've just said. And and some guy raised his hand in the back and said, Well, if we like Trump and we have the American political system wired, why should we care about this change among young people and particularly among young Jews? And it's not that easy a question to answer. The reason to care is is if the Israelis feel like they're part of world Jewry, and the United States is almost half of world Jewry, Israel and the United States together make up 80% of world Jewry, then mm -hmm. you're alienating half of the people who make you feel less alone in the world. The other reason, and this one's a little more complicated, um, the, the people we're training to be our next Secretary of State and Under Secretary of State and National Security Advisor and so forth, they are coming up with a very different view of Israel than any, than their, than their, uh, the people who hold power now. I actually, I knew, I knew Tony Blinken pretty well in the olden days when we were young. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if Tony, I actually saw him this summer at a poker game. Uh, he looked great. You put, really, did you play poker with him? Yes, I did. Who, who, who came out ahead? There were a lot of people in the game. I, I came out ahead in that game, but I don't remember if Tony did. It was very cool. He came in, like, I assume there were guys outside in black cars. So he came in just like he did 20 years ago. Um, but Tony and I, we used to talk about uh, politics and, and we had very similar views. And I wouldn't be surprised, and I have no knowledge of this, but I wouldn't be surprised if privately, he's just as critical as, of Israel as I am and most of my friends are, but he can't act that way. And he can't say that because structurally, Israel still controls the, the pro-Israel side, quote unquote pro-Israel side, still controls the discourse. Um, right. Now, I'm not sure that'll be the case in 20 or 30 years with future Tony Blinkens. And, and then Israel will have a whole new set of problems. And that's one reason why the quote unquote pro-Israel people are so concerned with how Israel is treated on college, elite college campus. They're worried, they're worried about two things. It's, I spent a lot of time on this in the book. There's two reasons why colleges are such a big deal and why the problem of, of pro-Palestinian activism is so enormously exaggerated among Jewish organizations. One is, is that the people who pay for these organizations are the parents and grandparents of the kids, and they're terrified 
of what their kids are learning. But the second one is that these places are training the future foreign policy leaders of the country, and they're worried that if they learn from the uh, the, the, the intellectual children of Edward Said to hate Israel and to call it a settler colon- colonial country that practices apartheid, then Israel will be in a lot of trouble in the future. And and there's some truth to that. But, I mean, that will traditionally. Sorry for going on here. Traditionally, the the State Department and the Defense Department have been much less sympathetic to Israel than the White House and Congress have been. And lately that's been less the case, but my guess is it'll probably become more and more the case in the future. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the word apartheid. I mean, that, that, that is a good, the history of that word and how it's received uh, when, it's, when it's applied to Israel in America is a good example of how, on the one hand, the discourse, the rules governing the discourse have changed, and I think to some extent loosened, and, and that has to do uh, with this younger generation, even though the kind of, uh, at the policy level, in terms of American policies toward Israel, I, I, I don't see so much change, but but that word, I mean, he, as you know, Jimmy Carter wrote this book uh, called, uh, what was it, uh, Peace Not Apartheid or something, was yeah. in the subtitle or title. Anyway, he didn't even say Israel is an apartheid state. He said we have to deal with the Palestinian problem so it won't become one, right? Right. He, what he said, I mean, it's not a very good book, unfortunately. But No, but he got he, into a ton of trouble was, for even that. He, oh, yeah, that, and that's covered in the book. And he ended up apologizing to yeah. Jews. He used a uh, religious term. But what he was saying in that book was something that Israelis had been saying for a very long time, including Israeli prime minister and ex-prime ministers and heads of their intelligence organizations, which is if we continue on this course, we are, are at risk to becoming an apartheid country. The problem with the word apartheid is that people think of South Africa when you say it. They think of racial apartheid in the way it was practiced in South Africa. And the way that uh, Israel critics and particularly Palestinians use it is um, with regard to the uh, ICC definition. Uh, which is a legal definition. And under that definition, um, Amnesty International made the case that all of Israel is an apartheid regime, not just the West Bank. And That was the report that came out not that long ago and caused a big uh, stir. Right. It was Human Rights Watch made a similar report. Israeli human rights groups made a report. But Amnesty International, first of all, is the biggest organization. Second of all, it was the most critical. And third of all, it was 280-something pages with, I think, almost 1,700 footnotes. And also, it was very aggressive politically. Now, I don't know how. I'm actually, it's it's good to talk to you about this. I haven't figured out exactly how I'm going to talk about it in the future. Because I think you can make a case that Israel, that Israel proper does under, operate under an apartheid regime as defined by the ICC. Uh, in some ways it does, in some ways it doesn't. There's no question that Jews are treated much better than Arabs are. And Arabs are 20% of the country within the Green Line. But outside of uh, the Green Line, in the West Bank, it's unarguable. It's unarguable that the settlers live under a completely different set of laws than the Palestinians do. And much to the disadvantage in every respect to the Palestinians. It is it definitely fixed the def- legal definition of apartheid. Now, what's so ironic about the debate is that the pro is again, and whenever I say pro Israel, I'm putting it in quotes because I think people who take a different view of Israel are also pro Israel, in fact, more so. Um, in any case, the pro Israel side insists that you make no distinction between the West Bank and between Israel. Every time anyone in Congress says we should uh, allow this to happen in Israel, but not in the West Bank, or even the EU, which they actually pass laws in this degree, or Ben and Jerry say, we're happy to sell our ice cream in Israel, but not in the settlements. They say, you're an anti-Semite. They say, how dare you? They're, they're, they, they absolutely won't allow it. Um, and yet, they can't deny the reality that, that what is taking place in the West Bank is a form of legal apartheid. So if, if, if the West Bank is Israel, as the Israelis today say, and as the American Jewish institutions who support the Israelis say, then Israel is guilty of apartheid. 
Hmm. If you if you take the position that the West Bank is not Israel and that it, it, it should be given back and we need to work towards that and find a way to do it, um, then then you don't have then then you can have a discussion about Israel proper and you can make the case that it's not. And in, in some ways it is, in some ways it's not. Don't they, the, can I just yeah. interrupt and ask, do they do you sometimes get a kind of technical legalistic reply from Israelis saying, well, strictly speaking, the settlements in the West Bank we consider part of the Israeli state, but the rest of the West Bank where the Palestinians live and can't vote and don't get due process of law and so on, that's actually not, is it, did, did, I'm just wondering, they that's what I'd say if I were them. I mean, they don't say that. They don't okay. say that. They, what they say is the ones who are, who are not committed, the, the ones who are not going to be in the next government say, well, in the future, there's going to be a peace agreement and then those settlements will be part of it. So it's okay that we treat them like mm -hmm. they are now. Okay. But in fact, what keeps happening, and actually there's a report today, um, they keep taking more and more of the West Bank and setting up illegal settlements that have no sanction. And then they go to the government and they say, make us legal. Um, and, and the government does almost all the time. So today, I, I, uh, I, read, I saw a report that um, Netanyahu had agreed to make more illegal settlements legal. And therefore, take over more land in the West Bank. There's no Israel does not has not. I mean, there are no borders there. Mm. So whatever Israel feels it it wants, it can take. Uh, there was a, a legal case that ended recently, where Israel uprooted thousands of people from this village because it said it was a shooting area for the IDF, and uh, over a thousand people lost their homes and schools were torn down and so forth. And, and the Palestinians who live there have no recourse. So, um, so, so again, it's a ridiculous position that the Israeli side and the pro -Israel, the pro Israel institutions have taken by saying yes, it's part of Israel, but if you say apartheid, you're an anti semite. Mm -hmm. um, and they call Ben and Jerry, Ben Cohen and Jerry, whatever, anti semites. It's ridiculous. Ben and Jerry have the same position as most American Jews. Which is, I support Israel. I love Israel. I'm proud of being an American Jew. But I think this occupation is terrible. I think it's destroying democracy in Israel. It's not the Israel that I want to support, and therefore I'm going to do what I can to try and stop that. That that's actually the position of a majority of American Jews. But but according to American Jewish institutions, which take their cues from the Israeli government and not from American Jews, that's that's unsafe. It puts you outside of the discourse. You're a bad person. And I have millions of quotes in the book like that. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't mind, I want to make a point here about the larger. Much of the book is devoted to the way the, the policing of the debate by American Jewish institutions, by neoconservative pundits and writers, including especially um, Martin Paris of the New Republic. Norm I know Parsons Marty. Commentary. Yes. Um, Abe Rosenthal and William Sapphire, the New York Times, many others, um, and how they attack personal, quite person, quite personal terms. Anyone who speaks outside of the defined boundaries of what they consider okay, um, but these boundaries keep changing. So, like uh, President Kennedy was advised never to say the word Palestinian, was and he? then Jimmy Carter, and Jimmy Carter caught hell for saying the word homeland together with the word Palestinian. And, and Andy Young lost his job at the UN and had to quit because he met with a member of the PLO, which he was doing actually on behalf of Israel. Um, because that was the only people you could negotiate with. And Barack Obama had a similar problem. And Tony Judd was fired from the New Republic and pilloried in many places because he wrote an article in the New York Review that didn't meet with people's attention. And, and Steven, even Steven Spielberg, Caught hell from well, uh, from Republic. Munich for doing the movie Munich. Munich. Yeah. yeah, and 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 the, and what I'm saying is that the words keep changing. So now everybody says, "Oh, I love the idea of a Palestinian state." It's just that we can't make peace with them right now. And I actually agree with that. There's nobody to make peace with. I wouldn't. I wouldn't make peace with the Palestinians if I were the prime minister right now. I would. I would work towards it, but I wouldn't do it today. Um, but but the attacks are so personal and so nasty. And so transparently designed, and I expect some of these on myself, although I, I, I also expect attacks from the Palestinian side, um, 
that uh but what's so ironic about them is that is how is how the boundary was this one day and the next the, the people who are doing the attacking are saying what the people they were attacking were saying six months ago because the, the discourse has moved uh -huh. yeah it's uh i imagine you will get some flack um i mean one of the uh it's okay i have tenure yeah i know congratulations that's a great place to be in the world well, let's. Uh, why don't we make sure we get some of the history in, and uh, and, and go back a ways in time. I mean, first of all, I mean, uh, so some big thresholds in the book are certainly like the Six Day War in 1967. I was interested to find that, like, uh, that 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 is my first memory of Israel. Like, I'm 10 years old and I see on the cover of Newsweek or something the Six Day War. I, that's the first time I remember thinking about Israel. I was interested to find in your book that. Even in in American Jewish consciousness, that that played a big role in bringing Israel to the forefront. Now, but if we want to back up a little before that, I was interested in your emphasis on the on the movie Exodus, the the, the novel, and then the movie Exodus, which I guess came out in 1960, and kind of crystallized, you know, the view of Israel that you know today, you know, APAC would like you to to hold. Right? Do you, do you want to? You want to talk about yeah. that? We're going to start off with sure. that. Well, well, like I said, um, in, in the beginning, in the 40s, the Zionists were seen as left-wing. The nation was totally in Israel. Izzy Stone um, and the New Republic, back when it was a liberal magazine also. And uh, and they were all for the, the Zionists were the anti-imperialist side. The British were the imperialists. The Arabs were these backward people who didn't know what was good for them. And, uh, and Israel was a socialist state. And uh, even the Soviets supported the creation of the state of Israel. And, uh, and so left-wingers were very happy with Israel. And, uh, and, then, and then when Israel was founded, uh, it, it, it sort of receded from the headlines and became a kind of Disneyland for American Jews. They didn't really go there. They didn't know much about it, but they raised money for it and they planted trees and they maybe marched once a year in an Israel Day parade and they liked the idea of it. Um, and it got great press. And the most important piece of propaganda for Israel ever created, the Israelis loved it, even though they thought it was crap, was um, Leon Uris' 1958 book, Exodus, which was then made into a movie by Otto Preminger starring Paul Newman, um, whose father was Jewish. He's the yeah. most beautiful man ever to have a Jewish father in Israel. <laughs> um, I'm sure, I'm sure and, you can um, get an argument on that from some corners. I but. don't know. I don't know. Um, and, uh, and this movie was such naked propaganda for Israel. It even, it even I mean, the, the book was incredibly popular, too. It's, it, the book was one of the best-selling books of all time. So it's and about it, the creation of Israel, right? I actually haven't seen it, but it, it, it's about the founding yeah, well, of the, the book, state. The book, I mean, Leon Yeris was a megalomaniac. He said that I want to write another chapter of the Bible. But actually, for American Jews, Exodus kind of became a kind of Bible, like every American Jewish family in the 1960s had a copy on their shelf. And, and, and I grew up, I saw it when I would have sleepovers with my friends. It was always there. I remember it, the blue and white book. And, um, and it's just, it's just, it's a terrible book. It's very melodramatic. And it's, it's incredibly racist towards Arabs. And it, the Jews are, are, are uh, paper characters. But it, it, gave, it gave American Jews, again, a sense of pride, a sense of meaning that they didn't have from their own experience of Judaism. Um, there's a scene I describe in the book where uh, uh, the American, where Jewish uh, soldiers come to a suburban synagogue and they say, you know, we blew up these tanks. We, we had these bombing raids. And the, and the American Jews, the doctors and the dentists all say, yeah, we blew up the tanks. We had these bomb raids as if, as if they had done it and they hadn't done it. The movie's even worse than the book in that they put Nazis in the movie. Like the Arabs are also Nazis at the same time. That they're Actual Arabs. literal Nazis? Yeah, yeah. They got Nazis working like the, the Arabs are being given orders from Nazis, you know, who've escaped from Nazi Germany and helping them fight the Jews. Um, but it was incredibly popular. It was a liberal. It was a liberal uh, cause too, uh, and and that also cemented this 
Disneyfied notion, this mythical Israel in the mind of Americans. But again, it wasn't that important. Uh, American Jews had their own lives to live. They had their own concerns. They were moving up in the world and they were fighting uh, social barriers and they were also quite concerned with liberal causes, particularly civil rights. But then again, 1967 changed everything. There was a moment right before the war when uh, people thought they heard Nasser say, we're going to um, send the Jews back into the sea, throw the Jews into the sea. Now, Nasser, I don't think ever said that. Like, there's no evidence they actually said it. But people said things like that, and Nasser said things like that. And, and people felt like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. We're going to let another Holocaust happen, and there's nothing we can do about it. And then, wonder of wonder, miracle of miracles, Israel wiped the field with them in six days just the amount of time that it took God to create the universe. Hmm. Um, and, and people really thought they were living in a, in a time of a miracle. And, that, and it was the most wonderful thing. They went from despair to um, rapture overnight, and it transformed the meaning of being a secular Jew in the United States. Uh, and, and again, that, that became the central... I quote a number of rabbis in the book saying, they're not, they're not giving an order. They're describing the situation, which is you can come to our synagogue or a synagogue. They don't mean their synagogue. You can come to a synagogue and you can say you're an atheist. Um, you can say that you think that, uh, uh, you know, that Judaism is a, is a cruel religion. But if you say you don't support Israel, you are shown the door. Um, I quote, uh, a man named Ken Stein, he's a very important guy, actually. He came up with the definition that's used for anti-Semitism. And he, were, he was the anti-Semitism expert at the American Jewish Committee. And, and he, again, he said a similar thing about the American Jewish Committee. He said, nobody ever asked if you were celebrating any holidays or had any knowledge or even cared about the Jewish religion. But if you didn't march in that Israel parade, uh, you were going to hear about it. Um, and it was on a Sunday. And 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 some of the people were there weren't Jewish, but that was the dividing line. It was, it was that, that's what they were about. That's and and it's it's you know that's that's what moved people. That's what moved uh, contributors. That's what moved people to join. And so, like I said, it's it's become beginning in 1967, up until recently, it's become the defining characteristic of what it means to be a secular American Jew. And and in my view, as a historian is that that's in part responsible for the crisis that secular American Jewry faces today. Um, now, what is exactly uh, the, 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 the... The demand for fealty to Israel. Okay, okay. Which is A, a completely vicarious experience, and B, at odds with what American Jews believe politically. Okay. Now, the, the, uh, so the 1967 war... Uh, it became a great source of pride in Israel uh, and kind of, you know, crystallized pro-Israel sentiment, I guess, in America. And I think not only among Jews, it was it was it was seen as a very heroic thing, but it also planted the seeds for, for you know, the occupation. So immediately the, then they had all this land after that war in the West Bank and back then it included Gaza. And they had to figure out what to do with it. Now, if I remember from uh, Gershom Gorenberg's book, The Accidental Empire, mm -hmm. um, they, they actually, the foreign ministry, the Israeli foreign ministry sought the opinion of their legal counsel on, on the, the status in international law of establishing settlements. And the guy said, no, that would violate the Third Geneva Convention, which Israel signed. Um, but they, but they went ahead and uh, they did it. I, I don't know how exactly the politics played out. And I know Gershom d depicts it as, you know, not a particularly uh, intentionally orchestrated thing. You know, I mean, the construction of settlement after settlement. It's just like at each moment, it kind of made political sense to build another one, as I recall, uh, his argument. Uh, but anyway, uh, that, that led to the mess we have now in some ways. Um. Well, you're, you're right. Uh, I mean, that's part of the story, and it's an important part of the story, that they did have these legal views. I mean, Israel takes the position that nobody owns the West Bank because after 48, uh, there, there was supposed to be an Israel on Palestine. There was no Palestine. 
Jordan administered it, but never, never um, annexed it legally. And so it's a sort of no man's land. And so there's no real international law that works for it. That's their position. But, but privately, they knew that they didn't have the right to create civilian settlements here. So what happened was two things happened simultaneously. One was, you know, all, all young people in Israel serve in the military. So they, they would create these settlements and say that they were military for security purposes, when in fact they were civilian people who also were in the military. Um, and they alighted it that way. The second thing, though, that's more interesting and, and today is much more important is that the, the historically there are super religious Jews um, were anti Zionist. Um, mm -hmm. And they still are in, not far from where I am right now in Brooklyn and in many places in Israel, because they think it's God's business to um, find, to found the Jewish kingdom, not, not the job of uh, those on earth. And, and, and the Jews themselves, the Zionists, were anti-religious back then, and they hated them. And then there was this uh, very important uh, rabbi named Ralph Kook, K-O-K, -K, and he, uh, he, he flipped on this. He said the Zionists, these anti-religious people like Ben Gurion, Shimon Peres, his, these famous Zionists and Rabin, they may not know it, but they are instruments of God. This is this is God's will, and and we they are creating the kingdom of God, even though they don't understand that's what they're doing. So we're going to work with them, and and then and so uh, so religious Zionism was born. And he had a son, uh, the second uh, Rabbi Kook. And this guy was much more radical than his dad. And he, he became the founder of the Gush Emanim. And he said, the land itself is holy. And we can't give up any of the land. Uh, in fact, we have to take over the land. What, what the Gush Emanim did is they would go into a heavily populated Arab area and say, we're establishing God's uh, you know, a little colony right here. And then they would say to the government, you want to see us slaughtered or you want to come protect us? Mm -hmm. And and the government had no choice but to protect them. And this happened over and over and over again. And it happened today. That's just what happened. The, the thing I mentioned earlier, they said they found an illegal settlement and they said to the government, you're going to protect us or not because we need protection here. And, uh, and, and those people, weirdly enough, these extreme... Uh, religious Zionists end up making U.S. foreign policy because the Israeli government can't help but support them or or risk uh, political damage that they don't want to endure. And then the United States doesn't want to take them on either. Doesn't want to take on Israel on the issue of settlements. So these people actually have been running things. There's a story I tell. I I, I borrow it from Ben Rhodes' uh, memoir, although I I read it in Barack Obama's memoir, where. In the beginning of Obama's term, he uh, Rhodes comes back from seeing this congressman, I forget who, and or maybe he doesn't mention his name, and uh, Obama's trying to get support to make Israel freeze its settlements. And the guy says, Ben Rhodes says to the president, he says, uh, that didn't go very well, he's not going to support us. And, and Obama said, wait a minute, I thought he opposed us to settlements. And Rhodes says, well, he does, but even more than that, he opposes doing anything to oppose the settlement. Hmm. And, and I say in the book, it started out as his congressman's policy, but by the end, it was Obama's policy. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, it, it's funny, you know, in terms of how much the discourse has changed, as I recall, there was a time when uh, saying you were in favor of a two-state solution was a radical, pretty radical position, right? Uh, Absolutely, yeah. And now it's almost, it's not quite the conservative position, but it's a lot closer to that because now you've got all of these mainly young people on the left calling for like a binational state, some kind of one state solution or something, which most people in Israel say is completely out of the question and crazy. Uh, but, but, but I don't quite understand, you know, the people who were saying uh, two state solution it's too radical. What was their long-term plan? I guess they just didn't. They just didn't. Well, APAC, APAC is in favor of a two-state solution. They are now the first. The first president 
who came out, the United States official position, Trump muddied the waters a bit. But George W. Bush said the position of this government is in favor of a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to say you're in favor of a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. The question is, is what concessions are you going to ask Israel to make on behalf of that two-state solution? Mm -hmm. Since Israel has all the land in question and controls all the land. And, um, and you know, the, that question has never been answered by anyone in a position to, um, to do anything about it. I'll tell you a story. I, 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 I was on the lawn with Yasser Arafat and, and Bill Clinton and Rabin. And, and, uh, and I cried real tears. I hardly ever cry. But I cried real tears listening to Rabin saying, we don't want to fight you anymore. On behalf of the Jewish people for hundreds of years. Because I had thought that that was impossible. I had thought, I had written in my first book uh, about the punditocracy, that Israel could never give up, politically speaking, Israel could never give up enough that the Palestinians would be able to accept, you know. Um, and it turns out I was right the first time. Israel could not give up anything that the Palestinians could accept. Peace was impossible at that time, and is even more distant today than it was then. So, and of course, Rabin um, was uh, Rabin was murdered by a settler. Yeah, murdered by a settler whose picture hung in the office of the man who may very well become the justice minister of Israel in the next government. Well, I, um, does it? Didn't he also have a picture of the guy who did the Hebron massacre? Is this yeah, the that's same what guy? I meant. I confused. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. No, I think it was. It was. But, yeah, it was. Right. It, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I take it back. It was Oracle. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, there were. But there was a lot of sympathy for this guy in this in these Kahana circles, and I think with one of these guys. But I should take it back because I don't have it in my head exactly. In any case, um, so everybody was. I wasn't the only person crying on that lawn. Um, everybody was thrilled at that moment. But uh, but the fact is, is I, I quote Aaron David Miller saying, uh, at the, "There's never really been the conditions for peace between the Israeli." The Israels, the Israelis and the Palestinians. There's never been a willingness on the part of Israel to give the Palestinians what they can accept. Now I'm, and there's never really been a commitment on the part of the American government to force both parties to accept things they don't want to accept. Um, so there's never, there was never ever going to be peace between the two countries. Now I'm very critical of the Palestinians in this book for never recognizing the weakness of their position and dealing with that fact. The, the Palestinians have historically either refused to engage in these peace processes or really engaged entirely on a rhetorical level rather than dealing with what they can achieve on behalf of their people. The leadership has and, and the support, the supporters in the United States have. So even today, um, we can talk about this if you want. The BDS movement strikes me as it's bo boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Yeah, yeah. strikes you as it's, it's 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 completely misguided um, in terms of actually helping Palestinians improve their lives, making uh, improving the lives of people living in refugee camps, living under occupation, and living in exile. Um, it wins a lot of uh, student elections. It wins votes in the Middle East Studies Association, the American Studies Association. It comes close to winning in food co-ops in Brooklyn, but it loses. It keeps a few rock stars out of Israel, but it does nothing to improve, to pressure Israel to do anything at all. It does nothing to pressure the United States government at all. And it won't. It can't. Well, let me, I, I'm curious, though, if, if it doesn't threaten Israel, uh, in that way, why does Israel work so hard to suppress uh, support for it, even to the, to the extent of supporting laws in, Amer in states in the United States, which actually get passed, which arguably are in violation of the First Amendment? You're familiar with laws where you have to sure. you're sign a contract that says you're doing business with the state or you're going to speak at a university. You have to say, and I will. I do not support <laughs> BDS, right? Um, well, well, why why are a, they so afraid of it? It's a, I don't think they're afraid. I think it's a valuable uh, 
excuse for them to do what they wanted to do in the first place. I mean, do you think that the police departments in this country are afraid of being defunded? Or do you think that the quote unquote threat of defund the police, which again, doesn't exist, mm. is a useful excuse for them to get more funding and to get what they want and to, to discredit their opponent? So look, Israel, I looked at the numbers recently, it was poll on this. Um, 4%, most Americans have never heard of BDS. 4% of Americans support it. 2% percent support it strongly. That's after almost 15 years of agitation on behalf of it um, since the movement began in 2004, 2005. There are, there are currently three congressmen out of 538 who support mm. BDS, who say they do. Um, it's, it's a nothing. There's not a single yeah, but, but, labor union. There's not know, a single government. You know, and I don't really have a, a position on the wisdom of BDS, but, but I, I would say you could probably say roughly uh, you'd probably get roughly the same numbers for just people who are critical in the way that you are of Israeli policy. There's just not that many Americans who care. Now, there's a, a fairly big fraction, certainly, of young American Jews, but that's not many Americans, right? No, uh, I no, mean, no. The, the numbers are not comparable at all in, in those two things. Uh, Israel is important to Americans. Um, not as important as other things, you know, not as important as abortion, but it, it matters. It's not a first level issue, really, for anyone, not even American Jews. No, it matters. It's not, it's, I mean, a lot of Americans have a view. I just don't run into many Americans whose views are critical. Uh, and that's, oh, no, no, but that's, they're, they're about 50 50. They're more supportive of Israel than the Palestinians, but the trend is towards the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. But Israel is still much more popular than the Palestinians are. Mm -hmm. And most people want America to be supportive of Israel. That's true, including the entire Republican Party, which takes care of a lot of people. But, um, but the but but you're right. What you're pointing to is an important phenomenon, which is most people don't really care, and the people who make the policy are the people who care, right. and that's why APEC and the NRA are similar because those people really care, and even liberal American Jews. I'm to the going to speak at the J Street conference uh, in a couple of weekends. J Street. Those people really care, but they also care about a lot of things. Liberals care about everything, you know. And but the conservatives have all these groups. They're a coalition of hot button groups: mm -hmm. NRA, the Christians, uh, APEC, and and those people make demands and they win because they're relentless and they don't go away. And and liberals, they care about everything. E even even the even the most uh, devoted opponents of Israel. You know, this whole idea, we can talk about this, this whole idea of intersectionality. You want to just talk about that? Sure. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, a legal scholar um, who uh, I know a little bit, we used to work together at MSNBC many years ago. Um, she's a very important legal scholar, uh, uh, a black feminist, came up with this idea of intersectionality, which says basically all oppression is connected. Um, so if you're a feminist, you have to be an anti-Zionist if you are opposing uh, inequality or supporting the uh, protection of the earth. You have to be a feminist or an anti-Zionist. In other words, um, the uh, the, the uh, and and you draw connections like the fact that it's particularly intense with regard to Black Lives Matter and the anti-Zionist movement. So they were very upset. Understandably, I would say that the ADL was training. ADL had a program for cops, American cops, to train with the Israeli military um, on crowd control, and so forth. Um, now, it, it grew out of Edward Said's idea of Orientalism, in my view. Um, now, uh, I think intersectionality is a very interesting idea, and and I could teach a seminar where we would have very different ideas about it, and it would be very interesting. And I'm I'm not rejecting it out of hand. But I am rejecting it out of hand as a political strategy because uh, you can't, if you care about everything, you don't, you can't do anything about anything. And time, attention is a limited, has a limited value, limited quantity. And people can't focus on everything. They got to focus on one thing or two at the most. And that's, a, that's why in, uh, the right is always kicking the left's ass. Because they have people who are there on abortion, on guns, on Israel, um, on, 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 on inequality, you know, tax breaks. 
who never go away. It's all they care about. Whereas people fighting them have a hundred things to care about mm -hmm. and, and do go away because they're doing something else. Well, in foreign policy in particular, there's this thing where most people don't care that much about it. I mean, with abortion, a lot of people care, actually. But on foreign policy, it's like Cuba. Most people just don't think about it. And so you have a pretty small lobby uh, that exists largely in Florida that has tremendous clout uh, just, just because there's nobody on the other side. And I kind of wonder, like going forward to get back to Israel, uh, you know, will there ever be a balance of power between the quote unquote, you know, pro-Israel, the traditional pro-Israel community and the young uh, progressives or leftists or whatever who are anti-Zionist? And and I guess one reason I'm skeptical, um, I mean, in theory, you'd think it could happen. The younger people will get older. They'll they'll get more money, so they'll have more of the kind of clout you get out of political contributions and so on. But one thing I wonder is, is there just a qualitative difference between uh, feeling that there's a country that's imperiled and represents your ethnicity, on the one hand, and 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 having I, you know, concerns about social justice and so on, you know, which, look, you see a lot of passion on the social justice side of it. I don't deny it. And and and, I, and, and the question I'm asking never occurred to me before this conversation. So I don't know. But I'm just wondering if a kind of uh, I mean, maybe this is a, uh, an unfortunate term to use, but a kind of a blood and soil, you know, uh, motivation it has some kind of inherent strength. And I, I don't mean to compare. Uh, staunch supporters of Israel to various other groups that are identified with the term blood and soil, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, well, what the term I use, which I borrowed from a professor I had at Cornell named Benedict Anderson, is long uh, distance. He, wait, ben Benedict Anderson? <clears throat> yeah. The, the great the scholar of nationalism. Yeah. Ima imagined he, communities, yeah. Right. He coined in that book the term, I was actually in the room where he sketched this out on a whiteboard before he wrote the book. It was very exciting. Um, but anyway, he coined this term uh, long-distance nationalism, which it mostly applies to like the Irish. You know, the Irish mm -hmm. left Ireland, but they're still nationalists for Ireland. It is, the, with regard to American Jews in Israel, it's unique and interesting because American Jews have been nationalists for a country most of them have never visited. Most don't have any relatives there. Very, very few can even speak the language. And yet it was the center of their identity. Now, again, that's ending. We're going to enter a new phase. Um, but uh, with regard to your question, I am skeptical that the uh, anti-Zionist side will ever amount to much politically. Um, again, the, the pro-Zionist, the pro quote-unquote pro-Israel side has the entire Republican Party. It has all of evangelical Christians. It has many of the wealthiest people in the United States. Um, I think uh, there's, a, uh, there's a period, I, I quote in the book, where Sheldon Adelson gave uh, the Republican Party half a billion dollars. Um, and, uh, and, and, and there's just nothing remotely comparable on the other side, nothing. And, and if you look at how U.S. policy is made, well, it's made as a reflection of power. And no matter how, this is why I'm so critical of the Palestinian side for just trying to win arguments on campus and, and so forth. And, 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 and at the, you know, a nation editorial meeting, it, it has nothing to do with actually helping the Palestinians. But what, um, what, what should they be doing? I mean, go ahead and finish your thought, but I'm curious as to what you'd say. Well, um, you know, it's a tough question. Um, it's not easy to answer. The answer lies, I mean, uh, the Israeli government doesn't care what any American thinks, and certainly not what American, American Jews think. They'll, 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 they're happy to accept American Jewish support, but they're gonna do what they were gonna do no matter what. So the question is, is what moves the American government, if anything, to change its policy in the Middle East? Now, there's no question Biden's policy is better than Trump's policy. And any Democrat is going to be better than any Republican. But the question is how how much um, 
political capital is a Democrat like Barack Obama, who was very sympathetic to the Palestinian side, willing to spend on behalf of improving the lives and forcing the Israelis to be nicer to the Palestinians and also helping the Palestinians develop the kind of institutions they would need were they ever to have a state because they don't have them remotely now. Um, and Obama basically gave up. Uh, he, he, he looked into it, he tried, he, he devoted some attention to it, and then he decided this is just not going to pay off. And, and he let John Kerry carry out these negotiations, which he never really had any faith in, and they failed. And then uh, when everything was over, he vetoed a resolution. Uh, or he didn't veto a resolution, I forget which, in the UN and caught all kinds of help from uh, the pro-Israel, quote-unquote, pro-Israel side, even though every other president for him had allowed these resolutions to go back to go past. He ended up signing a memo of understanding that gave Israel $38 billion over a 10-year period that no one's allowed to touch. It's law. Mm. It's not going to be changed. And yet he was considered anti-Israel. They, they, these pro-Israel, they hate him. Yeah. Uh, your friend Marty tested him um, for these reasons. So uh, as long and by as... By the way, the, even the uh, the thing he did at the UN where I think it was refraining from vetoing an, right. uh, an, a, a something uh, Israel considered anti-Israel. Even that he didn't do until after, uh, until he was a lame duck, until after the final right. and, election. And also, and, and, and Kerry eventually presented a peace plan, which was the United States position, but again, only after yeah. it had no power because Trump was already president and it could be ignored. Yeah. So because there wasn't, there wasn't any payoff. Now, Jimmy Carter was heroic, absolutely heroic in, in forcing both sides to come to a deal and did more for Israeli security than any president since Harry Truman recognized him in 1948. And he was pilloried by American Jews, by the American Jewish leaders. For the, e e for the Egypt for the Egypt deal? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, he took Egypt off the table as a, as a military threat. Yeah. And that has made Israel safer than anything any that has happened since the founding of the state of Israel. By the way, I am told that Marty cried when that happened by someone who was watching it on TV with him. So okay. I don't know if that... If that uh, it helps or hurts your opinion of him, but I just thought I'd throw it out there. My opinion on Marty is fixed. It's, it's not moving. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, the relentlessness of these institutions uh, has has gotten them what they want, pretty mm -hmm. much. Now, the question is, is how will they proceed in the future when they can no longer pretend to represent American Jews? And we don't know the answer to that. I mean, they will pretend, but when they no longer do, and and it becomes obvious when their when their supporters are more Christian than Jewish, and and the answer is I don't I don't see any levers where the other side can really grab power, but what they should do is 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 you know strengthen themselves in in Congress and in the executive and in the media. Um, which I guess is what they're trying to do. I mean, my position is basically to give up. I, I've, I've decided, uh, I mean, I, I'm not speaking as the historian who wrote this book now. I'm speaking as the American Jew. Form, I used to call myself a liberal Zionist. I no longer do anymore because I don't think there's such a thing as liberal Zionism anymore. You know, it's, it's got about, uh, there's like four, four or five seats in the entire Knesset out of, out of um, like 100. Uh, it's tiny. There's no possibility of a two-state solution uh, that I can see. I agree. Um, so, so I care deeply about the future of American Jewish life and American Jewish culture, and I have, have changed the emphasis of my life to that because I, I just find uh, caring about something that can't happen to be too frustrating and too depressing. I admire the people who continue to do it. I'm not telling them not to do it. But I think they need to be a lot more strategic about how they go about it. Um, By it, you mean not but, just like liberal, uh, well, whether or not they'd call the themselves. Caveat, I, you, an important caveat. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> yeah. I don't have an answer to that question. Um, my, 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 you know, I, I, as an American Jew uh, who, again, who, who always felt deeply connected to Israel. I, my parents sent me when I was 14, when I was 16. I went to college there for a semester. I, I have friends there. I have family there. I don't want anybody to suffer there. But 
it's a different country than the one I live in. It's a different community than the one I live in. Um, my, my concerns are closer to home. Uh, they don't care what I think anyway. Uh, so, uh, so I'm not uh, as attached to trying to make a difference there as I was. And I think if you read my book, you'll see that American Jews and America itself is not, is not as powerful as people would like to think. And, and there isn't much to be done. What is to be done is to improve our own country. I mean, our democracy is every bit as much at risk as Israel's democracy is. And there's a lot more we can do about it. And uh, you, so you said you don't think a two-state solution can happen. I pretty much agree. I mean, I can imagine, I suppose, uh, triple bank shots or something. But, but I basically uh, came away last time I went there with that same feeling. And you also think that that the uh, various versions of the one state solution are equally impossible. Well, I mean, the left wing versions, you know, I don't I don't mean Israel just well, just the going BDS, ahead. The BDS position is that Israel is going to voluntarily turn over its country to its enemies. And and my question is, what's the theory of how that happens? And the theory they don't really ever answer that question. But if you get an answer, it's, well, world pressure will force them to do it, will force them to create a free Palestine from the river to the sea. And when has world pressure done anything, Israel? much less make yeah. them give up their entire country I and mean, turn it over every, to people who want to kill them? Not everyone would characterize all of these solutions that way. I mean, they, they imagine, you know, binational, you know, federal systems and so on that they would say don't that's have not the property. The position, that's not the position of the BDS. The position of the BDS. Okay, group. but I the, this is interesting. I didn't ask you about BDS. I asked you about people who support some version of a one state solution. And you immediately equated that with BDS, which surprised me because I wasn't asking about tactics. I well, was what asking is, what is about the ones we have. We have. A one state solution now. Okay. Israel controls one state. Yeah, that's uh, the right wing uh, one state solution. We but you have, know what I we mean. have I a mean, one state solution. I mean, like so a the question is, is how could there be a state whereby the power is moved to the Palestinians? Because Palestinians outnumber the Jews uh, between the river and the sea. If you include the West Bank, there's more Palestinians than there are Jews. Uh, as of very recently. At, the, at, the, at best, it's half and half, but the birth rates are much higher among the Palestinians. That's counting the Palestinians in Israel proper. Yes. Okay. Twenty percent of Israel. Twenty percent of Israel proper are Palestinian Israelis, and and the West Bank is, you know, the rest. And and when you add the Israeli Palestinians and the West Bank Palestinians, they're just about a majority. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have good figures, but that's, that's those are the best figures. So, so they would have a majority. So right now, Israel has everything and the Palestinians have nothing, by and large. So are you saying that somehow the Israelis are going to be convinced to give the Palestinians half of everything that they have, or more than half, because they do represent more than half, and in the future, they will represent even more than half. How is that going to happen? Now, everything in Israel, politically speaking, particularly as evidenced by the last election, is moving in the other direction. Okay? It's moving in the throw the Palestinians out, uh, right. make, them, make them. So how yeah. in the world are you going to, when, when everything is moving the other direction, how are you going to turn that ship around and have it move not just in the right direction, but so far in the right direction that there's no precedent for it? How is that going to happen? I don't see it, okay? I am, well, yeah, it's beyond well, was, my imagination. It takes an question. act of God. It takes an act of God, in my view. That was my question. And, and if if uh, if neither of those things happens, two state solution, you know, binational solution, whatever. Uh, do you have an idea about what happens? I mean, uh, I mean, there's ethnic cleansing. Uh, you know, you can you can uh, push so many Palestinians somewhere, I guess, into Jordan or something. There's that. No, no, Bob, nothing has to happen. The Israelis are very happy with the situation mm. as it is now. They, you go to Tel Aviv, it's a wonderful place. I, I just spent eight days in Jaffa. I got, I got uh, COVID there. And uh, it's a wonderful town. I could live there, you know. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's up on the sea, and it's great food, and there's great boutiques, and, and lovely hotels, and you can play tennis. It's fantastic. Um, and the religious people are happy. 
you know, ever since Israel built this uh, wall, this fence, the security fence, as I call it, there's very little terrorism. There's very little, you know, there's very little physical threat to them. And they have a great little country. And now we haven't talked about the so-called Abraham Accord, but they're being embraced by Arab countries who are much more concerned about Iran than they are about uh, Israel. So Israel's under no pressure to do anything about the Palestinians. And the Palestinians are powerless to make Israel address them. So the situation from the position of the Palestinians is, is very despondent. I don't, I don't blame them for that. And in, in position from the people who would like to see Israel be what it was intended to be, which is a, a democratic state that honored its Jewish, um, co uh, I don't want to say Jew Jewish democratic state, but a, a state where Jews could live as Jews in a democratic state. Um, that's, that's, that's gone. So, so to get back to your book, if you're saying that Israel uh, actually can preserve the status quo in effect forever, and be prosperous and happy. And, and yet, on the other hand, you do see a trend among younger American Jews uh, to be uh, very opposed to that kind of future. Then it seems to me you are, you're also saying that, in truth, notwithstanding the amount of time Israel has spent courting American Jewish opinion and trying to shape it, it doesn't really matter. Israel does not need... A, a whole lot of American policy support to do to do fine, and 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 for the end, it doesn't need it. It doesn't yeah. need it. No, you're right. Yeah, it doesn't need it. It's going to get it anyway. In the near, in as far as we can tell, in the in the in the foreseeable future, because of the Republican Party, it has it has all of the Republican Party and about half the Democratic Party, unquestionably. Now, as the Democratic Party begins to reflect, as the Democratic congressional uh, elected officials. In the Senate and the House begin to reflect the views of the people we're talking about, they'll lose a lot of support. Like it's it's a it's a very interesting moment when the FBI says we're going to investigate the killing of an American citizen, a journalist, half Palestinian, half American. Which and just Israel, happened. Yeah, yeah, and and the Israelis say it's none of your business. We're not going to cooperate. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's that's a new sort of development, and the fact that um, Chris Van Hollen. Ben, ben pa the senator from uh, Maryland? Uh, I'm not sure of the name. Chris Van Hollen, I think. I confused that name in my head with Van Patten, the actor. Um, he's led the charge on this. And you would think, you know, years ago, he wouldn't have been able to do that. APAC would have punished him. APAC would have run against him. APAC would have raised money to defeat him. But he's secure enough to do that. So, so that's where the line is now. You can't kill a partially American journalist on the West Bank. And get away with it, and refuse to and refuse to investigate it yourself. So that's actually progress, um, believe it or not. And and there are, you know, there are there are uh, there are people in Congress who are not part of the squad who are willing to listen to arguments on on that and where Israel, uh, you know, is at fault. Again, that's new, but it's not much. Uh, there were there was you know there was a vote right after the May twenty twenty one war over whether or not to give Israel an extra billion dollars over the 38 billion it had already been promised to pay for the Iron Dome, mm -hmm. uh, the replacement of the Iron Dome missiles they had lost. So it got eight votes. Eight votes and one abstention. The abstention was AOC. Um, so eight votes out of 538 votes is not a lot. And it's not even a lot to build on. It'll be a long time before that's uh, 100 votes, much less 200 votes, where it's yeah. still losing. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's a very long road. And in the meantime, I would like to see a lot more effort devoted to helping improve the lives of the Palestinians. I, I've been in a Palestinian refugee camp. In fact, my life was threatened in, um, many years ago uh, in the 1980s. It's the worst place I've ever been in my life. It was so horrific. It was, uh, you know, uh, um, shit and piss were floating in, in the ground right next to you, you know? Uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't have sewage. They didn't have decent sewage. The they kids were undressed. There was snot coming out of their noses. This was they, where? They was not, this in the West Bank? In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Uh -huh. In East Jerusalem, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and those people's grandparents 
who are in the camp and their grandchildren are in the camp. And I think that's outrageous. There's no reason for that. We, you know, we need, these people need to be invested in. They need to be educated. They need to be fed. They need to be given some hope for a future. And, and, and that's where, if it were up to me, I would invest my um, energy. Now, it's not up to me. What's up to me is my own country, my own city, my own where I teach. And, and so I feel like I can be of use there. But, um, but I'm very disappointed that, uh, I mean, we can talk about this. We should probably end this soon. Uh, one thing that doesn't get enough attention is that the, is the divisions, the structural divisions inside the Palestinian movement and why it's actually impossible for the Palestinians themselves to make peace. Um, you know, when Barack made that offer, uh, it wasn't as great an offer as people pretend, but it was a pretty good offer given what they had uh, with uh, in under Bill Clinton in um, the camp David, uh, the second camp David. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and the Pal and Arafat could not accept it, and he could not accept it for a few reasons. One was that Saudi Arabia and Egypt said you can't accept it because they weren't giving away enough of Jerusalem, and. And like, that's not even the Palestinians, that's Saudi Arabia and Egypt, you know, that's the whole Arab world. But there's different kinds of Palestinians. There's these Palestinians living in these refugee camps and whose grandparents did it, whose grandchildren will. Then there's Palestinians living under occupation, millions of them. Then there's Palestinians living in exile, uh, you know, unhappily. And there's Palestinians living very nice, wealthy lives, you know, in all over the world. And these people all have very different interests. So if you want to help the people in the refugee camps and say, that's my priority, well, then the people, the first the Egyptians and the Saudis and the Syrians and the Libyans are going to say, no, you can't, we're going to kill you. And then the people living in exile will say, no, we're, we're entitled to the whole country. I want to return to my family home. And the people on the, in the occupation will say, no, we want full rights. And, and so you can't satisfy, it's impossible to satisfy all of these different constituencies simultaneously. So the best thing to do if you want to stay leader is stick to the rhetoric and mm -hmm. stick to this beautiful dream. And that's what they did. And, um, I, you know, I understand the conundrum. But again, I, I don't have a solution to this. But my one thing, I, I spent seven years on this book. And I came away far more pessimistic and depressed, both about the way that Israel had treated the Palestinians historically, but also about what that had led to, both in terms of the quality of the Palestinian leadership and the possibility for um, any peace. Uh, I quote in the, towards the end of the book, I quote this guy who had been head of the, one of the top three people in Mossad for 25 years. And he said, you know, I'm sorry to say it, but everything's really fine. I mean, Israelis are, are they would like to have peace with the Palestinians, but it's not that important to them. It's not a priority. It doesn't really come up in their lives. And Israel's just had five elections in a row. It was not even an issue. Nobody mm -hmm. raised the issue of peace with Palestinians. Yeah. No, I, I would just, before we go, I would say, you know, when you, when you raise the issue you raised with Palestinians, or at least an issue related to it, which is, you know, well, one version of it is, where why no Palestinian Martin Luther King or why no yeah or or or, uh, or why, why has not more in the way of a coherent and effective political movement emerged? They will say, well, Israel works pretty hard to to prevent that. And and if a, and if an aspiring Martin Luther King did did start to show signs uh, of making headway, he'd probably wind up in jail or something. And you know there is the the well known case of course where you know the Bush uh, George W Bush administration said, okay, you know, let's have, Palestinians should have elections. Yes, Hamas can run. Everyone can participate. It's a democracy. Well, Hamas won. And we said, well, no, that can't happen. And, you know, after the election, some Hamas leaders were saying tentatively and maybe in qualified terms, but they were saying, no, we can imagine a long-term peace with Israel where they were bar barely allowed to finish the sentence. I mean, we just said, no, you won the election, but no, you don't get to we're not we're not going to buy into this. And then you had this kind of civil war among the Palestinians. So there is, you know, they're not they're not living under optimal conditions for a coherent political <laughs> movement. I agree. And I and I call that the Israelis ace in the hole. There, there is no one to make peace. With. Um, and and maybe that's Israel's fault. I mean, Israel played a role in the creation of Hamas. Um, uh, but uh, I, I mean, I always thought that 
a purely nonviolent resistance against the Israelis could be successful because the world, particularly American Jews, might not let Israel, like, shoot them and kill them mm. and beat them up. If, like, a general strike, that was, that was like a sit-down general strike. I could see that galvanizing world opinion and appealing to many Israelis and maybe making a difference. But that's inconsistent with the whole mentality of the Palestinians who 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 admire violent resistance and strong well, resistance. I don't think it's just that. I, I mean, one thing I've always thought would be effective is if they just made their goal getting to vote. If they said, that's all we want, we're living here right next to these settlers who get to vote, and, and, you, and you're saying that you're a democracy and yet they get to vote just because they're, they're Jewish or something. What is the deal here? All we want is the vote. I've always thought that that might be an effective a thing to organize around, and 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 if you mobilize peacefully, you might be able to get a lot of world support. But what you what you what you hear about that sometimes is no, that's normalizing the occupation. You're 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 asking to buy into the Israeli political system or something. But so I don't. Well, it would be it would be a smart policy rhetorically, but the Israelis will never agree to it because they would become a minority. Um, well, yeah, but I mean, well, what I uh, the way I used to imagine it when I thought a two state solution was so possible is that you might mobilize enough world, uh, you know, global support on behalf of this Palestinian aspiration to vote that the Israelis uh, might think a little harder uh, and make more concessions in the way of a two state solution. So, but anyway, it's all at this again, point. I, I the, don't don't have much more optimism. Of, the history has taught me that Israel is basically immune. The outside pressure. Yeah, but they, they you know, they, the United they, States gives Israel thirty-eight billion dollars over ten years. Israel could walk away from that. I agree. Say, I agree. Yeah, they don't so, need the money. So, they would like the support in the UN, but if worse came to worse, they'd live without that. And and say mo uh, most you know. most Israelis feel that the world is anti-Semitic. That 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 they did nothing during the Holocaust when it was obvious, and that they will do nothing again. And that the mm -hmm. only people they can depend on are themselves. This is so if they feel that their security is in any way at risk, they will do whatever is necessary. Damn anyone else's opinion. And and that feeling has gotten stronger in recent years. Well, the other so, issue, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm, fine. I'm fine. No, go I ahead. just I think I also I get the idea that they think of anti-Semitism as this kind of universal constant. Like it's always gonna be there. And one thing they they uh, they don't give thought to uh, is the possibility that anything Israel does could exacerbate that problem. Um, That's true. That's true. And, and, they also, and in again, fact, I've heard that it's anti-Semitic anti to even suggest that anything Israel could do could affect uh, you know uh, anti-Semitism anywhere because then you're kind of I don't know, maybe it's because then you're conflating Jews with Israel or something. But of course, they do think, in, they do in some think ways, Israel encourages that. They yeah. do think Israel, that anti-Semitism is a constant. They think that American Jews and other Jews, French Jews, show a lack of self-respect by living amongst anti-Semites. Um, and that someday they will have to admit that it's impossible and will have to come live in Israel. And they're lucky that Israel is playing so tough with the rest of the world particularly the Arabs, so that there will be an Israel. That is a mainstream view. And it's also a main, historically a mainstream Zionist view, that, that the diaspora, uh, uh, you know, is a shame, has a shameful history, and that Israel has revived the, the, the meaning of Judaism in a way that people are fooling themselves if they think they can live the old way. I just saw this video last week that was so interesting that I didn't know about. After the um, there was a, a Charlie Hebdo uh, yeah. attack in France, and um, and uh, Bibi Netanyahu, who was then the prime minister, went to a French synagogue right. and said, "You guys all have to move to French Jewry is over. You all have to move to Israel." And you can see it on YouTube. I just, yeah, I just he, he was, he was not well received by everyone there. As right? I they stood up and they sang La Marseillaise. <laughs> they, they spontaneously it was just like Casablanca it was beautiful <laughs> um, so so 
I mean, th this week, actually, again, uh, the, one of the things the new government, the new Israeli government is talking about, because it has these religious zealots in it, is changing the law of return so that it's no longer, if you have one Jewish grandparent, you have to have one Jewish, you have to have your Jewish mother. You mm. can't be a Jewish grandmother. That's the Jewish mother. Otherwise, you're not, you don't have the right to become a citizen of Israel. And this is one thing that American Jews push back on because the Israelis are saying, you're not really Jewish if you have, uh, if you don't have um, a Jewish mother. And, uh, and it's, it's funny. It's funny because American Jews don't want to move to Israel. You know, they never have. That's, that's, that's one of the, I mean, we haven't really talked much about this, but that's one of the oddities of the American Jewish Zionist movement. They were anti-Zionist until they, were, they figured out that they didn't have to move there. And they said, okay, we're in favor of it as long as other people move. The first chapter of my book is called Zionism for Thee, but not for me. It was Louis Brandeis, by the way, who was the key person in the switch. Um, so Americans just don't want to move to Israel. But they don't like it so much when the Israelis show their contempt for diaspora Jewry with things like this. They say, you're not really Jewish, um, as we define it. And that, that, that is going to get, that conflict is going to grow and grow. And this is actually the only one that puts the leaders of American Judaism on the hot seat, American, the American Jewish organizations. They're, they don't mind really when Israel beats the crap out of the Palestinians or bombs this or that. But they don't, they're very uncomfortable when they tell American Jews, you're not really Jewish as we define it. And, and they fight back on that. And, and there's going to be more of that because they're bringing these religious zealots into the, into the uh, government. So that part will be interesting. Again, it will, be, it, will, it will further reinforce the argument of my book, because we are not one argument, that they're two very different peoples with two very different ideas about the world, two different kinds of governments, two different kinds of politics. And, 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 and American Jewry is at risk so long as they don't recognize this one. Okay, well, that seems like a reasonable note to end on, unless you want to say anything yeah. else in closing. No, you've, you've worn me out. This has been great. I really appreciate okay. it, Bob. It's really, and it's I really win. If, great. If you're more tired than I am, I win. Um, okay. All right. Well, thank Where's you, Eric. It? Very impressive. Very impressive piece of work. We are not one. Uh, it, it's coming out even as we speak. By the time this is posted, it will be available uh, at Amazon.com, bookstores everywhere I'll say, I'll say one more thing about the book yep i started it 40 years ago really it's the subject of my honors thesis as an undergraduate and i saved my notes i interviewed people including Ron Penhart. i interviewed people for the book that i saved back then then i spent wow. another year on it um when i went to stanford to get my doctorate i spent another year thinking i was going to do my dissertation on it but i said these jews the thing about the the purpose of a dissertation, for those who don't know, is to show you know everything about a given topic. That's the only thing you're really supposed to do. And I said, these damn Jews, they write too much. I can't deal with everything. It's impossible. So I put it aside, and I wrote the book that became One President's Lie instead. So I've been thinking about this and wrestling with it for 40 years. So I spent actual seven years writing it, but I spent mm. 40 years in my head. And it's, it's uh, I'm sorry to say this as straightforwardly as I'm saying it, but it's the best thing I've ever done and ever will do. So, I, you know, it, it combines all the things, the media analysis, the U.S. foreign mm -hmm. policy, my research about Jews and Judaism and stuff. Um, and Israel, uh, it, it was the perfect subject for me over time in terms of what I'm good at. And, and I feel proud of it in a way that I've never felt anything else I've ever written. Well, it shows. I mean, you, you, you exhibit a command of the subject. It is sweeping in scope. Uh, kind of reminds me of the novel Exodus in terms of its sheer sweep and scope. <laughs> that would be why didn't you get that blurb? Not since Leon Uris's Exodus. Wait, wait, re re read the blurb from um, <laughs> read it. it says, Don't go looking for Exodus in from who David Myers. Which blurb? No, Aaron David Miller. What does it say? Uh, oh my god, he mentions Exodus. I'll read the whole thing. You deserve it. Deeply researched and beautifully written. Eric Alterman's We Are Not One sketches out the forces in the public debate that seek to influence and shape the image of Israel in the mind of America. With support for Israel still very strong in many quarters, he also tracks increasing divisions, generational differences in partisanship in America's politics that have made discussion of Israel more complex than ever before. 
spoiler alert, if you're looking for the Israel of Leon Uris's exodus, you won't find it here. Well, that's close. That's close. Uh, <laughs> and he, of course, uh, was a was a uh, you know has been a negotiator in more than one case, an important American negotiator who tried, who did his best, I guess. But he's also right. the one who he said, was, he "I was think." At that Camp David meeting. Is he the one who said the problem is that uh, America in negotiations keeps serving as Israel's lawyer rather than as yes. uh, that's him? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He's talking about Dennis Rawson. Well, yeah. Okay. Don't get me started on that. Uh, okay. Or you, probably. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Eric. Good luck with the book. Thank you so much, Bob. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye.